الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين ولعنة الله الدائمة على عدائهم مجمعين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم a faithful life is marked by their connection with their God. And that is what gives that definition of a person being a faithful person. That connection with that intimate, profound source, an aspiration towards that lofty goal. Now this connection of ours with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that adds meaning to life, that makes it substantive, that gives it worth, is not merely a connection of devotion and worship as we understand through the practices of devotion of salah and prayer and formalistic attending to rituals of devotions. It is something which is quite personal. And in the personal capacity, that profound source plays a role that nobody else can play in individual and human's life. As human beings, we have a facade. We need to portray to the world what is acceptable by the world, a personality that the world is comfortable with. But within ourselves, there is a different story altogether. So much so that those closest to us like the one who has given us birth, may never know what we truly are from within. Now that inner self may experience a lot of turmoil, insecurity. The inner self is fragile, it is weak. It is this inner self that truly is what I am at the core of myself. With my doubts, with my frailties, with my insecurities, <coughs> with my misgivings of my own self, with my likes and dislike of what is happening outside myself. It is this part that truly requires attention, that truly requires nurturing, that requires somebody to assist, because that is what I really am at the core of myself. Let me give an example as we go along. You might see me in a very composed state right now, in a very dignified manner. But if you were to put me under test, extreme circumstances, the inner being that is concealed now by this outer personality would then manifest himself. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that until when they are upon the ark and they are faced with stormy waters, they cry out to Allah pleading to him. Now that crying out to God knows no sense of protocol. They will not then say that there are people around me and I need to be dignified and maintain my personality. The true person would reveal himself in a state of panic and utmost turmoil. That is the true me. Now it is here, like it is here that that profound, intimate connection is of the essence. That God, subhanahu wa ta'ala, needs to be acknowledged at that level of my core. In the whole of this connection between individual and God that gives the definition of faithful, what is really required is that inner truth to be open and available to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What does that mean? What that means is that a person 
finds a lot of strength and encouragement through God rather than shying away from God in a state of pretense. And that marks the essence of that connection and that is the point where God begins to work from within the individual. Until now, the God that I've worshipped has been a God that has been introduced to me through religion, through hearsay, through mental workings of my mind. But I have yet to feel my God, to touch my God, to live with my God. I have yet to glimpse the God of Hussein that allows him to so, in a dignified way, fare through the tribulations and the tests on the plains of Karbala on the day of Ashura. That God to whom he was so open, when he was frail and weak, he shared it without a sense of shame with his God. When his heart broke, he said to his God, you see what is happening to me. And it is sufficient for me that I share this with you and that you look over me. That is the God that is our true heritage. That is the true connection that is there. In light of this, the best gesture of devotion is the gesture that is made through weakness to God. Ali Salamullah Ali says to Allah, I seek intercession with you through my state of weakness, through my state of need and poverty. And how may I seek intercession with you through any other state? For this is my real state of being, my poverty. At times, the only thing the great Lord wants is for me to say, Oh Lord, I am unable. Assist me, help me. I am in need of you. At times, the greatest act and gesture of devotion is to say to Allah, oh Allah, I have fallen. Extend your hand and allow me to walk again. At times, the only thing my Lord wants to know is for me to say to Allah, oh Allah, this heart is filled with arrogance. Why should I hide it from you? You see it in me. You have accepted me as I am. Don't make me run away from myself or hide away from myself. Let me be open with you and cure me. At times, all he wants to know is that we say to him, O oh Lord, I am afraid. Be with me. I am unsure. Encourage me. I have failed. Console me. And this acknowledgement of God at that level of weakness that is our inheritance is the greatest gesture of devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And actually, it's the truest gesture of devotion to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in fact, if we can learn to do that unashamedly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then that, in the rightest sense, begins the journey of a human individual in a meaningful way. And that may lead us to some form of a worthy rank before we meet with him inevitably. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa al-Asr inna al-Insan al-Fi khusr illa al-Ladina amanu wa amilu al-Salihat wa tawasaw bil-Haq wa tawasaw bil-Sabr. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillah, rabb al-alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal-mursaleen. Wa alihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Amma ba'd as-salamu alaykum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Even though religion, God, and talk of faith seems to have become outdated, and out of fashion in the modern world. Yet, there has never been a greater need to 
God and faith as there is today in the present world and in the modern community of the human beings. Today, I think, the true religion, the true sense of righteousness is dawning from the hearts themselves. Today, we need God through a variety of manifestations in different religions. If we look at these faiths and religions, I think we understand fully that human beings have hijacked a noble, profound human message. And that at the core of all these religions and faiths lie a very beautiful sense of life, a worthwhile and a meaningful sense of life in the name of God and God-human relations. If today's world, with all its faiths, Christianity, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, Islam, Judaism, if these faiths were to come together and say, let us use the name of God and the untarnished teachings, moral teachings of our scriptures to foster goodness within humanity, these faiths can take us to a state which is truly worthy, a world that is worthy of human existence. We need to have utmost confidence within the faiths that we have and use these faiths as a basis for harnessing goodness within human community. When we talk with people of non-faith persuasions, it becomes somewhat arduous and difficult to talk on the basis of goodness for the sake of goodness. But when we talk with people of faith, no matter what faith, the task becomes easier because at the core of every faith lies that fundamental relationship with God and that God is a force of goodness. And the God that is defined at the core of every religion is the same God. He is colorless yet colorful genderless, yet represented by both genders, languageless, yet the author of all language, religionless, yet the one who is claimed by all religion. We find an untarnished beauty at the core of every religion and at the core of every faith. It is for us here to take this opportunity and to realize this and to know that we can work through faith. It is good for us, therefore, in our communal capacity and individual capacities to extend a hand of humanity and godliness primarily to the people of other faiths and use the basis of God and use the belief in God as a basis to bring about greater understanding and greater goodness. I believe we all have a duty and a role to play. From the people around us, to our neighbors and other communities, to bridge the gaps between us through the already existing medium of religion and God. To be encouraged. Now this is something very, very important. We can become extremely dismayed by looking at this world of ours today and the crisis of the world of ours. Or we can be extremely encouraged. It depends on how our outlooks are. But becoming dismayed further adds to the worsening of the situation. And our human godly nature wants us to be optimistic. So being optimistic is our real state of being. All we need to do is to look back at history and look at those profound creatures of God. Look at the Prophet of Islam. In the midst of immorality, killing, bloodshed, plunder, he had a very positive attitude. And he built on the good sentiments that existed within people. Today, at least we are a few people in this room. 
There was a time he stood alone at the door of the Kaaba and carried out his mission. If one person can so decisively change the history and the course of humankind till the day of Qiyamah, imagine if a group of people were to be encouraged through him and decided to make that difference, why couldn't they do something? And today we're not a few people, we have like-minded people, so we should be encouraged. We should never ever be dismayed or become passive or lose hope. <clears throat> we should always be extremely hopeful. I'm going to end with two things. One is that God needs to work at a personal level and God needs to work through us at the level of the community. You see, I within myself need to evaluate myself and examine myself. I do a lot of wrong then through God I need to put it right with confidence. The hearts that I hurt, I need to make amends with confidence through my God. The wrong that I have done, I need to rectify them through my God. Two, there is a lot of goodness that I can impart in my own limited way to those around me by a good attitude by the mention of God, by reminding the other of the goodness that they have. When a person is fallen and defeated, to tell them that the real success is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and within yourself. If through this failure you become a greater person, then that is truly the greatest success. So at two levels I need to work within myself and outside myself through God and in that way I think life can acquire some meaning I'll finish with one or two things now that even if I wanted to I can't change this world to be quite honest with you and especially when we read the scriptures and the Quran we know we can't really make a difference it is God who makes a difference through us yes look at the Sun and the moon and the Milky Way and whatever else you have there these hands have not constructed any of it by Allah, I, am not been, I have not been responsible for growing those trees. And everything we have grown with a perfect measure. It's already been prepared for us. Our task is a different task. Our task is to find that beautiful existence within ourselves and to remind others. To be encouraged that this might not seem a great deal, but yet it is the essence of life and existence. The small thing that we are saying. Two, be mindful of those grand creatures of God. Subhanallah. Their lofty stature and how wonderfully they have displayed what a good life ought to be like. I have narrated this in your presence, but I will do it once again because these are the days of the great master of our hearts. I was in Tehran and somebody came to me and said, look, you people, you tend to exaggerate the sacrifice of Abba Abdullah. But there was one thing Abraham did that Hussein could never have performed. And I said, well, what was that? He said, Ibrahim, at the command of God, left Hajra and Ismail in the wilderness and left. And that's true. He left them there and nothing was there, not even a shade. He turned his back and went towards his steed to ascend it. He made a prayer at that point that the Quran recounts. When we look into the historical texts and tafasir, Hajra was screaming at him and shouting at him and became very emotional as she ought to have been. It's quite right for her to do that. She said, Ibrahim, in whose care do you leave us? This child of yours will die. I can't believe that this is what you are about to do to us. And that is the only befitting response Hajra should have offered as a woman who is being left in the wilderness under the scorching heat with a little baby without any food or water. And you can say something about Ibrahim, the great faith that Ibrahim, Ibrahim, this great prophet has in Allah. As he turns his back on them, he says, Oh Lord, I have left my family in the wilderness, in a place that has no vegetation. O oh Lord, feed them. 
from the good produce of this land and make the hearts of the inhabitants of this land tend towards them or turn towards them gently. Abraham had that confidence. Some people today who would be analyzing him would say, well, he was maybe doing something very callous. But we know as faithful that Abraham had that faith. The true test was the test of Sarah, what was really happening in her soul. And I thought it is very true. What Ibrahim displayed was something grand. But then inadvertently when I thought of Karbala, I didn't even want to force myself to think. My attention just drew towards, and I saw a scene that is quite similar, yet the sentiment is very different. You see, Ibrahim in his own self had this confidence that his Lord would not let him down. The test was for Sarah, who really felt that this is the end of life for her and her child and destruction, the trauma that Sarah went through. Hussein is leaving and Zainab comes running behind him and she says, oh brother, in whose care do you leave your sister? I have no one. Now Hussein here cannot say, oh sister, may Allah feed you after I have gone. May the hearts of those around you gently turn towards you, for he knows what is to happen. Only thing Hussein says is, O oh sister, do not tear the arteries of my heart through your tears. After I have gone, your tears shall know no end. Hamid ibn Muslim says, that as he made way for his final battle, I saw the cloth of the tent lift. And I saw a child of three to four emerge. She walked behind him with trembling legs, falling almost and standing again. She drew near to him and she pulled at the hem of his garment. He turned around and her soft voice arose. She said, Ya Abata Umdur Ilayya. O oh, Father, look at me. In the Atshana, I die of thirst. Hamid ibn Muslim says, His eyes filled with tears. He extended his hand, placed it upon her head, and he said, Saqaqillah, Ya Bunayya. May Allah quench your thirst, O child. This was the Ibrahim of Karbala, who has left everything to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us our sins. May Allah forgive those who have gone before us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cause us to follow in the teachings of his prophet, the prophets who went before him and his imams. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be pleased with us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala cure all those who are sick. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant the wishes of all those who plead to him. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala impart the light of faith to our hearts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make our lives meaningful and productive. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be the agents of good that spread his light to the world and the example of his messenger and the example of his noble imams. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasten the reappearance of our beloved imam and grant us the grand boon of shahada in his divine presence. Allahumma salli wa sallim